Okay, I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District regular meeting of Tuesday, June 6, 2023 to order. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, the traditional keepers of this land, and we are grateful for their current and past stewardship. So in keeping with our practice of informing the board about the contents of Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action, we have call to action number 25 uh, regarding justice. We call upon the federal government to establish a written policy that reaffirms the independence of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to investigate crimes in which the government has its own interest as a potential or real party in civil litig litigation. And with that, we move to the in-camera recommendation. Thank you, and that following the regular meeting, we will go in camera according to section 92B of the community charter. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Um, so before we go there, we have a little bit of housekeeping. So I wanted to inform the board that I did have a late delegation request for this evening. Um, regarding uh, the agenda item F7, um, the public hearing around uh, Saratoga. But um, the delegation was heard yesterday at the Electoral Area Service Committee meeting. And because it is those same three directors that will be voting uh, alone on this um, agenda item, I felt that it wasn't um, needed for the presentation to be heard again. And uh, I would like to uh, vary the agenda to bring forward the F7 um, public hearing uh, item. Thank you. Moved by Helene, seconded by Grief. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. So we'll go to F7. Electoral Area Service Committee from June 5th. And um, as I said, this was just voted on yesterday at the Electoral Area Service Committee meeting. Uh, it's regarding a public hearing and the appointment of chair and vice chairs, first and second vice chairs for the public hearing. Director Grave, go ahead. I'm uh, just curious, uh, through the, uh, the chair to the acting CAO, should we not bring forward the minutes first? Um, so typically the recommendations from the electoral area services committee meetings will be um, following receipt of the minutes. Um, in this case, this recommendation, uh, these minutes will be presented to the following board meeting, June 27th, I believe it is. Okay. But this recommendation can come forward and be considered today. And uh, it, it enables then the CBRD to proceed with that public hearing if the if the board here supports There's that. A lot of plan. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just procedurally. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so there is a recommendation. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. Any further discussion? And uh, the recommendation is that Director Grieve is designated as chair and Directors Hardy and Arbor designated as first and second vice chair. And the public hearing um, is the date set. To be determined, yes, okay. Any further discussion? Okay, it's a vote of areas A, B, and C. All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. We'll go back to our regular agenda with the adoption of minutes from our regular board meeting on May 23rd. Okay. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. Any discussion of those minutes? All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to business arising. And we had a delegation follow up uh, for the Child Care Planning Committee for the Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative. Uh, yes, for, for receipt. Yeah. Moved by Grant, seconded by Kerr. Thank you. 
Over to staff. Thanks, Madam Chair. And Lisa Kilpatrick, our Community Development and Resilience Manager, uh, can provide a brief update on the, uh, the delegation that attended the previous board meeting. I think I might be catching Lisa. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, chair through, through to the directors. Um, we had the opportunity, as we will note in the social, social planner discussion, to meet with organizations um, to get some feedback and, and input on the uh, concept for the social planner. So uh, Jesse from the Early Years Collaborative was invited to that and did participate um, and share her thoughts uh, that, 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 uh, that were expressed um, at the meeting. So we considered uh, that input and feedback in, in the concept and the development of the principles that are presented within the social planner um, staff report. Great. And a reminder to um, the board that we'll be having our strategic planning session next week so we can uh, discuss those priorities further. Okay. So that was, uh, we're on receipt. I don't see any further lights. So all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Okay. Item two, moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. That's a rise on report on the land acquisition. Um, and I'll pass it over to staff. Thanks, Madam Chair. This is uh, simply reporting out um, a previous board decision that was made in February in a closed session. And um, it was um, made public when the CBRD finally did acquire this land. This was the acquisition of property for uh, the future Courtney pump station uh, along Comox Road. The details are included there on the agenda. Thank you very much. Any further discussion from the board? It's for receipt, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we are on to delegations. And today we have Beaufort Watershed Stewards. Uh, moves by Arbor, seconded by Hillian. Yep. And welcome Dave Weaver and Mark Lake. And you have 10 minutes to present and uh, we will have questions after if you're willing. For sure, can you hear me? That's pretty good, I don't have to be so close. Thank you very much, Jesse, and uh, thank you to the board for having uh, Beaufort Watershed Stewards present. Again, my name is Dave Weaver, and uh, that's the up and down button. Thank you. And I'm the president of Beaufort Watershed Stewards, and we have Mark Lake here today to present his project. Uh, he's a volunteer with Beaufort Watershed Stewards. He's a retired geophysicist. And so the title of his report is Using Geophysics to Map and Characterize Aquifers on the East Flank of the Beaufort Range. And I'm really pleased too and excited about this report, the beginning of an aspect that we've been doing and we appreciate the support financially and uh, emotionally and uh, encouragement of the regional district for our work. So my job is just to introduce things since I'm the president, um, who are we and what we do? And uh, which button is it? The top one, we'll try that, nope. The bottom one, there we go. <laughs> um, first of all, the land de dedication, uh, we respectively acknowledge the watersheds we depend on are in the unceded territory of the Comox, Pentlatch, and the Qualicum First Nations, since we're further south, and the traditional keepers of the land. Where do I point this at? Uh, the center, there we go. I don't want to point at anybody in the room. Um, our mission statement is quite clear. The Beaufort Watershed Stewards work to promote the health and resilience of local watersheds in the Beaufort Range and to ensure the quality, quantity, and fresh water for the future. We're a grassroots organization. We got started in 2017. We're a proactive group, nonprofit society, and charitable status, and we're solely driven by volunteers. We have seven board members and about 50 members. We're increasing in members as we speak. Go. Okay, I gotta lift one leg. There we go. Um, what we do, we're quite busy. We started with stream quality. We're doing stream quantity flow right now, groundwater wells sampling. 
We've uh, started forest or watershed health assessments. I'm on to my second one now. One of our major aspects is outreach and sharing what we have learned. And this jigsaw puzzle of understanding our watersheds within the region, the major piece that's being presented today is Mark's aquifer mapping, which is below our feet. And we have no idea what it is other than the methodology that he uses. So I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, yeah, the bottom one, you pointed at the center TV. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Lake. Um, this project was based upon some geophysical thesis work that I did back in um, the 1970s. Yeah, I know I don't look old enough. Um, we were using vertical electric soundings or VES resistivity technique to map glacial aquifers at about 100 meters below the surface, just the same as they are between Bowser and Royston. Uh, both a watershed successfully took this idea and pitched it to the University of Victoria as a potential undergraduate project in the spring of 2021. Um, we followed that by a field program in 2021 and another one in 2022. The 2021 one has been written up and is published in the BC Water Science Series report as of February 23. And um, the 2022 data um, has been presented in thesis by Savannah Yamamoto. Um, what was our objective? So we needed to prove the concept that these vertical electric soundings could be used um, to map aquifers. So we went through a ground truthing experiment in 2021. Uh, last summer, we, we got on to trying to do some mapping, characterize the glacial sediments and the bedrock looking for evidence of salt water as well, which is of interest to all the landowners in the area. And our goal was to achieve the density of subsurface information, same as um, is mapped out to the north of Comox uh, on the map shown here as part of the Aquifer 408 uh, plan. Geology, first starting point in, in, um, in tabular form, um, the geology of the area is very simple. Uh, a bunch of um, post-glacial sediments sitting on bedrock. Um, the, the unconsolidated glacial sediments are a few thousand years old, and the bedrock is a few million years old. However, once you move to some maps, um, it becomes a lot more complex. Um, our goal was to try and map out the difference between say the yellow sediments in the right-hand corner, um, so-called quadra, and the blue sediments, it's actually quite a challenge. And then you move to a schematic cross-section, um, it becomes even more complex. That, that sketch is about three kilometers across, and it's really quite analogous to our area. Um, you can see that there's this chips point kind of analogy on the, on the right-hand side and a Beaufort range to the left. And we're attempting to map out those orange sediments where they sit on the bedrock there, uh, the orange sediments sitting on the gray. So it really is quite the challenge to do that with a simple um, geophysical surface technique. Before we move on to um, where we were, um, this is, um, I hope you can see it. This was our first program. We did 10 surveys and following is our second program. We did another 10. I'd just like you to point out to you the, the measurement called Fanny Bay on the top right there. Well, I'll be coming back to that. And um, also the, the geology you may be able to see, um, that's government geology polygons on there. The, the reds are the bedrock aquifers and the, and the Yellows and golds are the um, glacial aquifers. The technique is a well established in aquifer mapping. It provides a, really just provides a proxy for drilling a well. The equipment is light, and, and for this area, we just require a 300 meter uh, access along a straight line. It's cheaper than a well. You know, a 100 meter water well may cost up to $20,000. Um, it's less accurate than a well. Um, the accuracy is plus or minus 10%. And of course, it's subject to interpretation, um, which is where the 
some of the art comes in. Here's what the equipment looks like, very lightweight, um, just laid, here's an example where it was laid out along the E and line. And on the right hand side, that's the output in the field. We actually get some interpretation in the field. Uh, CBRD funded the purchase of that software for which we are very grateful. This is the outcome, uh, the output from uh, these vertical electric soundings. This is the one from Fanny Bay. And it's just an example. And you can see you have bedrock there at about 30 meters below surface, and then nice bright yellow aquifer there between six and um, 20 meters. So it's, it's it really, the output is just a pair of depth and apparent resistivity readings, which, which we put our interpretation to. Here's where we started. This is all the wells from the area that um, we used for our geological control. Um, we audited those wells. Um, they're obviously not every water well in the area. They're the ones that we thought had good geological information. This is our first year program. You can see those red triangles there are our soundings that we, did, that we completed. And as you'll see, most of them are adjacent to um, the wells in the area. In 2022, we added um, another set of readings. Um, these are, those are the green triangles on that map. You can see we've actually infilled quite a bit and we've stepped off towards the west uh, up into the Beaufort range. Here's what we plan to do in 2023, the yellow triangles. And you can see there are still some gaps in the area um, that we will need to fill in, fill in future years. And this is where you know, we'll be requiring permission from various um, private uh, landowners and crown landowners in the area. And the support of um, the CVRD um, would be really helpful in that. And how are we doing? Well, we're actually getting some results. Um, uh, Left-hand side is from the Water Science Series report that we published. Uh, those are bedrock elevations there in the Fanny Bay area, um, varying from um, zero meters above sea level to almost 40 meters below sea level. So it's we, that's new information that's never been mapped before. On the right-hand side, that's an output from Savannah's thesis. And she's extended the app for mapping that's recognized by the government um, along the coastline and connecting up a lot of dots um, to some well control. And that's, again, that's new information for us. So we believe the ground truthing of our VES surveys has, has worked and it's, and it's fairly accurate. Uh, we encountered lots of um, gravel aquifers, 10 to 20 meters thick in our stud southern study area. And uh, we map bedrock in most of our um, soundings as well. We have interpreted salt water incursion in a, in a number of spots. Unfortunately, we don't have time to present that here, but hopefully maybe at a future time. And what are we gonna do? We're gonna keep going. Um, we've got 20 vertical electric soundings so far. Um, we'd like to acquire another 50 um, in the area between um, Bowser and um, Courtney. And again, that's going to involve collaborations with the University of Victoria, hopefully with the Comox First Nation as well and other landowners. I'd like to thank uh, Victoria and Savannah, both students from the University of Victoria, who um, did most of the work for this presentation. Also special thanks to their staff at Earth and Ocean Sciences. Um, Lucinda Lin Leonard and Mike Way, they were the supervisors. I'd also like to thank the co-authors of the Water Science Series report, uh, which is in the following reference list. And I think you, you have a copy of that already. I'd also like to thank CBRD for the funding of our software. Um, that's a real uh, nice luxury to have. I'd like to thank uh, Esri, um, who provided us with a non-profit um, uh, mapping license and uh, BC Hydro, who actually allow us onto their power line right away. That really opened up the land for us. 
And here's my uh, the reference list. And finally, um, any questions? And this is kind of where we're at right now. You can see those dots are fairly sparse on that map. And that's where we'd like to be, to have the same kind of control uh, as has been presented north of uh, Comox here on Aquica 408. Any questions? Great, thank you so much. That's a, a little lot long, of sorry. information. <laughs> I, I struggled with the report a bit. Um, and I do have a water background, so. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's, oh no, no, it's it's quite technical, but. It's quite um, technical, and there's, that's a lot to get into a short period of time, but I think it just shows you what can be done by a volunteer organization such as ours. Absolutely. And, and you know, bringing some real technical know-how to the, to the mapping here. Yeah, that's great. And do you see this information share, shared with the province and going back to help the province with their uh, water? Well, I, I think it, it's been published by the province. The Water Science Series is part of uh, provincial forestry, um, kind of looks after that for us. Um, so it's there for everybody to see. It's public. Um, are we, you know, have we seen any encouragement from the province? Um, not yet, but um, we plan to keep going anyway. Okay. Now we do have some questions for you, starting with Director Arbor. Thanks, Chair. I think you stole my question in regards to uh, the province and the Ministry of uh, Lands and Water. Um, obviously, this is one of my favorite organizations, the Beaufort Watershed, and uh, always thrilled to see your work and uh, and adding this one to it, which I'm thinking um, there's probably going to be a need to bring the different water groups, uh, watershed groups together. I know on Hornby and Denman, there'd be a lot of interest around this kind of. Uh, I'm in touch with Hornby. You're in touch with Darren Bond yeah. already? Uh, or um, or with, with John Cox. With John Cox, yeah. even better. Yeah. We have these amazing experts in our area. So he is amazing. Yes. So, okay, I'm glad the connection is already made. Yeah. And I was going to mention we're expecting a watershed service. Uh, report sometime in the future that will come to the electoral areas but um, this work is so critical in, in areas um, where most communities are going to continue to rely on groundwater for uh, for their water needs and in the case of ships point obviously you've got a pretty big system that's reliant on groundwater so the kind of information you're providing is i'm sure is very appreciated um and and, and just more not as much of a question but maybe just a you mentioned you may need uh some kind of CVRD support. So I don't know if it's if for staff, if the, you can have a touch base with Mark Rutten after uh, your presentation to, to explain what it might be or whether you want to vocalize yeah, that. Yeah, some direction as to what's the best way to approach some of these uh, private and crown surface owners. Right. Um, say that. So how to access the private um, uh, properties that you want to uh, do. Some yeah, I yes. mean, there would be logging lands, private development lands as well. Um, okay. Well, we, we already have permission from BC Hydro on their right of way. So that that was been that was a huge benefit for okay. us. Okay. Well, at minimum I can pro probably provide a director's letter of support uh, yeah, to the project. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. So, yeah, thank you and um, and I won't get uh, Dave off the hook. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, sometime this year we'll see the big study on the Sable River and uh, I know the uh, there you are. <laughs> I know the board will be really interested in that in terms of scorecard in regards to the management of our watershed. So, thanks for coming today with such a big uh, delegation. Thanks. To the audience. Uh, we do have one more question um, from Director Cole Hamilton. He's online. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. And thanks, Dave and Mark. Obviously, a huge amount of work went into um, putting together this information to share with us today. I wanted to follow up on one thing that you mentioned that uh, talked about saltwater incursion and said that was sort of a large issue and would require almost its own delegation. Being a layperson, that sounds not good to me. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little about what saltwater incursion means and implies and whether it's something we need to be uh, asking you to come back and talk to us about. Yes, I don't want to steal the thunder of um, uh, of any of our students on that. Um, it, she did address it in her 2022 um, report and um, we could certainly um presented again at another time um i um you know again it 
it is a geophysical technique and it is interpretation. So, you know, it's not cast in stone in the same way as drilling a well might be, but we'd certainly be prepared to put our interpretation in, in front of concerned people, that's for sure. But I mean, at the end of the day, that's how we started at Ship's Point, was the proximity of the, the wells to the high water mark. That's why we're doing this work. So we are kind of, so that's, that's returning to our roots. Chair, could I have a follow-up, please? Yes, go ahead. I, I was just hoping maybe in like a minute or so you were able to just um, put into context briefly the concern that currently exists or the years that you um, of saltwater incursion, just how concerned we should be, how significant it is, just to, just a really high level overview of, of what's happening and what significance it has. Just one second. Oh. Should we be worried about it? Is, is that what you're asking me? Um, do, we si do we see any signs of saltwater incursion in the well production? I, I don't believe we do. Um, it's, it's the fact that there's salt water in very close proximity to the producing wells at Chips Point. That, that's the area of concern. And I don't believe we have any concerns uh, from the evidence we have right now. Okay, thanks for putting that into context. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. And we've come up with some more questions. Uh, Dr. Hillian, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. I, I just wanted to um, acknowledge what you alluded to, that um, it's quite remarkable what you're doing as a volunteer-based uh, organization. Um, I had the opportunity, along with two colleagues, to speak to some uh, primary students out in Solon this morning and uh, was telling them about uh, the uh, uh, the prehistoric uh, fossil beds up on the top of uh, the mountains in our area, which indicates that that area at one time was underwater. And uh, um, you can see the wide eyes, uh, which I think all of us have as we, as we think about uh, just the incredible geology of this area. So the fact that you're actually uh, taking steps to, to, to map what's under the ground uh, and something as important as the water that we depend on, uh, I just take my hat off to, to all of you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, a lot of the, the maps that are in existence are actually you know, very old. And so this is all um, our data that we generate from our vertical electric soundings this brand new subsurface data that we've never had before. So it's it's really um, stepping forward uh, without drilling a large amount of wells to get that control. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. And Director Hardy? Yeah, thanks. I, just a question again, thank you to your, your group and your volunteers in regards to the very important work that you're doing uh, for our communities. Uh, the question I got for you in regards to how much further north are you planning on going with regards to uh, this very important work? Uh, I know uh, sitting in on the last few uh, agriculture planning uh, sessions for the Comox Valley Regional District, I know there's a lot of concerns about knowledge in and around this Holm River uh, watershed and just wanting to know if, if, if you were planning on going further north uh, in and around that area and whether or not uh, that would be helpful for the Comox Valley Regional District Agriculture Plan moving forward with regards to uh, water and conservation, et cetera. Yeah, no plans to go really north of the Trent River. That's kind of a sort of a soft line for us to the north. But I think we're very comfortable with, with our ground truthing experiment we've been through, and we quite trust our results. So in the future, yeah, I mean, some sort of collaboration to the north would not be outside the realm of possibility. The problem we have is we don't have any instruments for doing the recording, uh, and that um, we rely on the University of Victoria to provide that over a one-week period each summer. So um, it is part of our five-year plan to acquire our own instruments, and then we'll be able to do a lot more um, uh, recordings and readings, not only in the Beaufort watershed area, but in and around uh, CVRD uh, in some sort of collaborative way. Thank you. And a follow up from Director Arbor? 
Yeah, I'm glad for Dr. Hardy's question um, in the sense that I think what we'll need to think about at the board, I think the Beaufort is uh, going from strength to strength, but we're relying on um, you know public value being generated from uh, volunteer groups. And, and I think part of why I've been interested in a watershed service is to see what what pieces like that um, should be better supported by not, not only local government, but provincial and federal government. There's a lot of discourse around healthy watersheds and there's mostly words. And then you have volunteer groups doing a lot of the grunt work to actually get us data information and, uh, and assessments. And that saddens me actually that the province is not playing a greater role because this, this, this is consequential to how as a local government we manage our, our share of the pie in terms of the lands, but also for a private company and others. So uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to discuss this in the watershed service review and in, in terms of the scoping. And, and at that point, if we define, decide to fund that, then maybe we could look at the entire Comox Valley Regional District without relying on, the, on a volunteer effort. Um, and same with Hornby and Denman here, the same thing. It's volunteer group out of the goodness of their hearts, but... Uh, <laughs> I think at some point, if you want long-term data collection, mm -hmm. you know, you need some some yeah. some some uh, um, reliable supports. Thank you. Oh, and follow up from Director Hardy. Thanks. In in regards to the equipment that you're talking about, that UVic lends to to the organization, could you give us a ballpark figure on what the cost of the yep I have the an technology estimate. would be? It's um. Fifteen thousand um, dollars Canadian. Okay. Well, thanks for answering all our questions today and for the presentation and for uh, your good work. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, the last two slides here speak to the 2022 achievements, and then and then on the next slide is the 2023 um, work plan. Some of the priorities in there. Um, I'm not going to go through all the all the pictures on this slide here, but um, if there's any questions the board has about the 2022 achievements or moving forward into the 2023 goals and work plan items, um, your your executive team is more than happy to be able to answer any questions. So, like I said, very very brief presentation here. Uh, the corporate plan is available. It'll be posted on our website. And um, happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you, James. Open the floor to directors. And Director Grief. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would just like to commend the incredible quality of this, this report and the pictures and everything. I mean, it's too bad it isn't put in a, a book and available at our local bookstores. Thank you. I think there are a limited number of uh, printed copies. There are a few printed copies, but of course, we're trying to to, to limit the number of printed copies because that's, um, you know, that's, there's a balance between uh, printed copies and, and having too many available. But Director Grieve, I'm sure we can find a copy for you. <laughs> and Director Arbor. This series of questions, uh, obviously, I, I also enjoy the, uh, the report, but it, it does beg the question if... Uh, if we don't have a lot of printed copies, I, I think that we are investing a lot of funds in the design and putting together this brochure. So um, if we don't have a lot of printing copies, that can staff uh, tell us how many people uh, open the PDF over the course of a year? Um, I'm just wondering about whether we're getting a good return on investment because it is indeed a very good quality publication. I'd have to look to see if we can pull those statistics off of how many times the pages are open. Certainly the pages are... Uh, are available and they are promoted through various social media channels. Um, I'd have to double check to see how many actual uh, times it's accessed. And Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks to staff. I realize a lot of work goes into these types of efforts and uh, certainly concur that it should be shared as widely as possible. I'm just wondering, though, if um, uh, in the, the various reports, if there's any thought to presenting comparison, for example, just on the one issue of the number of transit rides to show how that has changed from year to year. And um, so that the um, apart from just being an accounting of what we do, it actually shows whether any significant progress is being made in the various areas. Um, just a suggestion for consideration. Thanks. Yeah, I like that. Any further discussion? Okay. And it's for receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And a big thanks to staff for another good year of service. So um, next we have the social planner role concept and next steps. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grieve. Thank you. Over to staff. Thank you very much. And Lisa Kilpatrick, our Community Development and Resilience Manager, is at the table today pre to present on, on this particular staff report on the social planner role. Lisa, over to you. Thank you. Through the chair to the directors. At the March meeting, uh, the board approved the funding for a full uh, 1.0 full-time equivalent um, position for a social planner and also provided direction to staff to go and speak to our member municipalities as well as some identified organizations on the concept that had been presented at that time. So we have since done that. Uh, what you have in front of you is uh, substantively the, the, the same concept that we presented, but we've also shared with you some, some principles um, that we uh, have been given feedback that we need to consider as we move forward. So at this point, it moves to discussion, I believe, at the board's um, strategic planning process. Following that, any further input will be considered by staff and included in, in um, the development of a job description. And then we will be uh, hopefully moving forward with a recruitment process and uh, a hire in the fall if, if everything goes well. Great. Thank you, Lisa. We do have some questions, Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks for the report. Um, I just had a question um, as we advance that position. And I know there's been uh, 
part of why it's taken so long, decades to get there, was there's always the comments about um, the downloading of provincial and federal functions onto local government. So I'm just wondering if if it if it hasn't occurred already, if we are planning a touch base with uh, our two MLA and MP offices to let them know that we are proceeding with this and see if they have any input around um, that could be valuable for us as we go into strategic um, uh, direction around this work. So, because um, I'm just I'm just thinking, um, and I don't know if they've been outreached to, but I, I think it could be a value. At, at the very least, for them to be able to go back to their their parliament and say, "Hey, our region is actually putting this in place." Okay. Next, we have Director Green. I'll be very brief, Madam Chair, just just to commend the board on reaching this milestone after 15 mm -hmm. years of trying. So it's uh, as some people would criticize it's just another uh, head at the, uh, the regional district and. Uh, warm body, but I would suggest that this is the key piece that we need to uh, work with all the various nonprofits and and uh, and senior governments to uh, to bring about some some real uh, change in the in the uh, social planning of the Comox Valley. So thank you. Thank you, and Director Kerr. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is really about how this position might work with the member municipalities, uh, looking on page 3.4 near the bottom, um, you know, part of the liaison role will be, to, will be to work with staff and member municipalities coordinate efforts to support collaboration. I mean, I really see this position as a someone who would find the synergies that exist across uh, the valley, something that's great that's going on in Cumberland, that'd be great to know about in Comox and Courtney, and how we can work together as communities and, and the rural electoral areas. So, I was wondering if I know that's just one sentence in that uh, in that three page report, but I was wondering if you could flush that out a little bit for me or explain how you see that role interacting with the the councils and staff at uh, at the member municipalities. Thanks. Thanks for that comment. Uh, so when we met with the staff from the municipalities, that was something that we that we certainly did speak to. We also agreed that we will need to circle back and, and really have, have that understanding. Um, and, and I think in the, in the principles here, we, we've mentioned a, a couple of things that will sort of help shape that work out. Um, one is the idea that, that you know, the, the position is, is sort of reaching up and to, you know, Director Arbor, your comment, uh, we heard lots about the, the role, the advocacy role that, um, that the board can play to the, those senior governments, um, as opposed to sort of reaching down and getting into the work of, of the, the member municipalities. I think also really understanding the difference of the, the action that can be taken at that regional level and that local level and where the gaps exist to facilitate that regional action. So, you know, the municipal staff do a lot of great work. What is it that we can do to help elevate their, their work so that there are those synergies across the municipalities? I think that the role of the social planner will be also one to, to see those opportunities, those opportunities at the grassroots level with the nonprofit organizations and where, um, where those meet up. Uh, with the municipal municipalities as well as the regional districts and, and really bringing that forward as an awareness. Thank you. Next, we have Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I just had a question around um, whether we're envisioning um, this position also addressing uh, the gap that we've ran into in the past in that um, the, the regional district has been asked to support um, grant applications or provide a, a lead role in, as an applicant, and it hasn't it hasn't really fit very well into um, our organization and our capacity. And I, I think part of this discussion came out of of that issue that we ran into in the past term. And I'm I didn't see anything specific in in this, and I don't know if that's something that will be hashed out later. But I'm wondering if you could comment on that at all, or if that's been considered. Hello. <laughs> so I think it was uh, probably in the fall that I brought forward um, 
staff brought forward a report on community partnerships and how we can uh, move forward with that to certainly address some of the things that, that you're mentioning. Um, I'm happy that in moving forward with the social plan, we'll have some more capacity to actually do that work and, and bring that framework and, and policy forward to the board to, to take a look at and contemplate. Thanks. And Director Hillary. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the report. Uh, somewhat similar question. Uh, it's not specifically mentioned in the report, uh, but perhaps implied that this role will take on some responsibility for seeking out uh, grant opportunities, uh, perhaps uh, to a greater extent than we've been able to do at the staff level thus far. And um, it's, it's my premise that had we had a position like this uh, um, some years ago, we would probably be further ahead uh, in housing than we are simply because it's been, uh, um, you know, a bit patchwork in terms of uh, the capacity of, uh, of various agencies. And, you know, the, we certainly command the work of the coalition to end homelessness, but it's never been resourced to the extent that uh, it could have been. So I'm just wondering if, uh, even though it's not mentioned specifically, you do see this uh, staff person's role as being to seek out uh, grant possibilities and uh, which would bring economic benefit uh, to the community and uh, perhaps uh, compensating for the cost of, uh, of the position. So I, I think that um, the benefit of having this role is that we move from a reactive position to a proactive position. And we're able to have those strategic conversations. And we're also aware of the work plans of our nonprofits, the work plans of our municipalities, so that those pieces can provide the foresight that when those opportunities come up, we can we can you know raise our hand and say, hey, I, I think that there's a you know um, a good use of those funds. Let's let's as a community pursue those grant opportunities. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Uh, it may also help to sharpen our focus as a community. I think back to the uh, the last round of BC housing um, applications, where I think there were five or six went in from the community and two that were uh, approved. And um, you think about all the work that went into the ones that weren't approved, and and whether that uh, effort could have been better spent if we'd uh, you know focused uh, in, in some way, perhaps. Uh, well, I know there's always uh, different instances of opinion about uh, how we do these things, but hopefully a position like this will help us to uh, uh, to collaborate more effectively. Thank you. Great. Thanks for your work on this, Lisa, and thanks for the director's input today. It's a good teaser for our two-day strategic planning session next week. So there's no um, recommendation. It was just on receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to item four, the Comox Valley Community Health Network update. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Morin. And we'll welcome you to the mic. I think Lisa Kilpatrick will introduce. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Danica? Yeah. You come on in, up and get up your computer there. So through the chair to the directors, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with the community health network over the past year and, and getting to learn um, about the great work that they're doing. Uh, lots of volunteer hours going into that um, organization. I would just like to acknowledge as well that we have two of the leadership group members. We have Betty Tate and Christopher Bate here um, to provide support. And Danica Lawson is going to be providing a presentation. Danica joined the Health Network in, I think it was September of last, end of September of last year. So Danica is the facilitator, the uh, sole paid staff of the network. And uh, she is funded through the contract that we have with Island Health to uh, then contract with a facilitator to support the work of the network. I'll pass it over to Danica. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Are you sharing? Yeah, I'm going to uh, have some technology woes earlier, so I'm going to share my 
screen, hopefully, um, share my presentation. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks, Lisa. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to uh, the board for the opportunity to be here today and to share with you what the Comox Valley Community Health Network is all about. Um, so as Lisa said, I'm Danica Lawson and I am the facilitator with the network and have, um, I'm still fairly new. Uh, and since starting, I've had lots of uh, new experiences such as presenting to the CVRD board. And looking, yeah, excited to be here today. And and also in this role, uh, I've you know I've been here for a short time, but I'm just so deeply humbled by the passion and commitment of the people that I get to work with every day. Um, so many people working on so many complex issues, and there's just so much hard work that goes into this. Volunteer hours, uh, you know, and paid hours. So I will just start with a brief overview of the network for those who might not be super familiar with it. Um, our purpose is really we're, we're community driven. Uh, everything we do is intended to be the voice of the community. And um, yeah, so we're, we really are centered on the social determinants of health. And so um, I'm gonna go through the partner, a little bit more on the partners and how we're structured in a few minutes, but you know, quite simply our vision is, is community health. Um, we want to live in a community uh, that's connected and thriving and where health and wellness is really at the center of everything. And every single person in the community um, has has opportunities. We are our core funding, as Lisa mentioned, uh, comes from the, from Island Health. Uh, we do have quite a few other funders as well, and I I want to make I take a moment just to to note those. So um, of course the regional district, the Quinnipiac Valley Regional District, um, has funded uh, the Health Network, the City of Courtney, the Village of Cumberland, uh, the Quinnipiac Valley Community Foundation. Spark BC through the Province of BC and Walk with Me um, under the the Quinnipiac Valley Art Gallery. And I've included a, just a really high level information on the budget, our budget for the last few years. And part of a, a chunk of this, a good chunk of this is where it goes towards a substance use strategy development, which I'll touch on a little in a few moments as well. So how we're structured, we're structured uh, quite a bit differently than uh, a lot of organizations in the community. And this is really a reflection of uh, we're trying to work in, in, de uh, in decolonized ways and also making sure that community voice is kept at the center of everything that we do and that we don't lose sight of that. So there's a coordinating circle that we that is sort of the core um, so the core uh, function. And so within that coordinating circle, there are community members. So when, when people come to the to the coordinating circle meetings, they're there wearing a community member hat. We do have several members that you know are involved in, in other things in the community, but when they're at the at the courting circle table, they're a member of the community and, and wearing that that hat and representing um, themselves in the, the community voice. We do do regular recruitment, recruitment um, typically annually, and anybody living in the Comox Valley is welcome to uh, welcome to apply to be on the coordinating circle, and we go through a, a recruitment process for that. There are also designated seats on the coordinating circle. Uh, so a representative from the Comox Valley Regional District, and so we are we feel very privileged uh, to have Director Cole Hamilton in as the appointee to the Health Network. Uh, we also have a designated seat for a uh, representative from the Comox First Nation, the Métis Association, uh, as well as Island Health. There's also a leadership team, and as Lisa mentioned, two members of the, the leadership team are here today, and thank you for being here. Um, so Betty, Betty and Chris, and we do have two other members as part of the leadership team as well. And there is a subset of the coordinating circle and, and they're really a support to the facilitator, uh, i.e. me in, in this moment, in this role. Uh, eternally grateful for all the support that they provide in the, uh, to me. And of course, myself as the facilitator. So I am a contractor to the CVRD. Um, I work around 20 hours a, a week. And um, my role is really around sort of that network administration and uh, kind of overseeing the operations, but really the decisions around priorities and activities are, are held by the community, by the coordinating circle, the core coordinating circle. And then it's my job to support the facilitation of what those decisions are across the community. I'm the community facing representative, hence why I'm here today. And uh, I liaison to the CBRD and, and Island Health as well. We also have several uh, partners. 
We have seven nonprofit community agencies that are uh, you know, official partners. They are all health and social, um, the health and social sector organizations aligned with the health network values um, as well as the health network priorities. And um, yeah, and we also, so you'll see a floating, a floating box on the, on the bottom right there, the substance use strategy. That, um, that, so that represents a substance use strategy committee. And I, I know several of you are familiar with it and it's floating down there because uh, right now it is, it's encompassed within the health network. And so it, it's, a, it's facilitated by the health network, but very soon it's going to shift into a community collaborative um, and it will be its own, its own organization, its own ent entity within, uh, within the community. But we very much will continue to work with that table and uh, so it will just become a, a purple circle instead of a green one and connect to this lovely structure. <laughs> and I just wanted to take a note and I know this that the bullets are very, very small so um, please don't be concerned if you can't read those. But I just wanted to highlight or just wanted to sort of create a visual that really we're a network of networks. So yes, we have seven, seven partners, uh, seven official community agency partners, but many of most of those, majority uh, of those are our networks in and of themselves. And so when we get together with our network partners, they're, they're really the sort of the voice of, of the tables that they, that they lead uh, and the networks that they lead, um, which can, which of course involves community members, at, at times family physicians, local business owners, um, People with lived and living experience are, are, are involved in many of the of the tables here of our network partners. So we we do rely on the partners to bring some bring some of that voice. Um, but I'm going to chat a little bit later about uh, kind of where we're where we've moved to as a as a network in terms of how we're working working with partners. So the, this model right now is, is somewhat hub and spoke, but we've really shifted from that um, and are sort of laying the foundations to work in a, a new a new and exciting way. So now that you're cross-eyed from looking at this, uh, these terrible bullet points. <laughs> so um, what, we, what we do, if someone could tell me that, that would be great. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just kidding. So yeah, so essentially we are really acting as a backbone for a community collective impact um, approach to a lot of things in the community. Um, all centered under under poverty reduction, and again, I'll go into that a little bit more in a few minutes. But just generally, overall, we we act as a catalyst and a collaborator on projects, uh, initiatives, events across the social sector, across the community, ensuring there's community voice at um, at those tables and hopefully decision tables as well. Uh, we do lots of work in the way of making community connections um, and you know engaging and engagement with the community and, and finding learning opportunities for, for the community as well and social organizations. We share information and data you know, if and as appropriate. Uh, we do have a role, play a role in, in advocacy and supporting our, our partners in advocacy efforts for things you know, such as housing, et cetera. Uh, we do, you know, project and event sponsorship. I don't know if I love the word sponsorship. I probably should use something different. But within our budget, um, you know, we, we do have funds allocated to supporting uh, various community events uh, and our partners in, in projects that are aligned with the network priorities. And um, yeah, so we do provide some funds for certain initiatives, um, initiatives in the community as well. And, and of course, you know, ensure, ensuring strategic alignment with, with local government uh, and the health authority priorities. And for those gardeners, uh, gardeners in the room, you know, for for I don't want to simplify or minimize, um, you know, what we do and, and who we work with. But it was as I was putting this presentation together, I was sort of, you know, because it's spring, and I love gardening. I was thinking through. Um, the, I feel like what we're doing is really like permaculture. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the three sisters, the three sisters um, garden on on the right there. But you know, we we are you know supporting the planting of seeds. We're we're working with the partners to sort of nurture you know nurture nurture those plantings. Um, that's a paintbrush. Someone's painting to cross pollinate. We do lots of cross pollination across the community, uh, organizations and, and individuals in the community to to connect the dots um, for common purpose. And uh, what's represented by that three sisters garden is there. It's a very synergistic relationship. Um, so. Yeah, it's a very synergistic relationship and every, you know, every plant is unique, like every organization we work with is unique. 
um, but together they they provide support to each other and they can you know they can be they can grow and do bigger and better things. So you know why why we do it why we're doing what we're doing and you know it's just really simply you know we're we're better together we're stronger together when we work when we're working in isolation uh, it's not only that we're working separately but at times organizations are competing for things like common common funding opportunities um, there's duplication of effort and you know I'm not I'm I'm sure this isn't rock and science I know you you all know these things but I just really want to reinforce this because of how we're shifting and how we're operating as a network and really moving into more of a, a collective impact approach so you know working working together uh, on a common on a common big vision on something that we we couldn't tackle and no organization in and of itself could tackle on its own or no two organizations could tackle on its own So I just want to provide a just a brief overview of just some some examples of projects, initiatives, and events that the Health Network has either led, partnered in, or supported uh, over the past few years. You know, I could put an extensive list in here, but I just wanted to to bring your attention to a, a few a few of them um, just to show the variety of things that we we get involved with in the community. So I don't I won't read read them all out loud. Um, I know you can all read, but I'll just I'll let you I'll let you look at that for just a moment. And then I'll I'll draw your attention to the, the three at the bottom. So the Comox Valley Regional District Poverty Reduction and Assessment Strategy, that was a big piece of work that was done in collaboration um, with the municipalities, uh, or sorry, local government, all the local governments, as well as a variety of various organizations in the community, including the Health Network and the Coalition on Homelessness and the Social Planning Society. Uh, it's a, a, an excellent uh, an excellent strategy, an excellent piece of work, and it is what we're using as of the basis for uh, all of our work going forward, um, it, which includes the accessibility audit of the Comox Valley, which is actually ongoing right now, uh, which you know, I know it will feed into, and speaking of synergistic relationships, um, there, you know, some nice synergy there with the accessibility work uh, that the municipalities will be doing as well going for, pardon me, going forward. And then again, just centering on how we do it. So I talked a little bit about this idea of collective impact. Um, it's a bit of a busy slide, but uh, again, I just wanted to really focus in on this, the poverty reduction assessment and strategy that was, that was developed or um, published in 2021. You know, of course, a lot has happened between um, between when it was published and now, in in across all communities globally, really. Um, so we will be taking some time as a as a you know health network, including our partners and the collective impact table, to to really look look at this and sort of reassess, reevaluate, get community voice on you know what are the priorities now? Are they still relevant? Um, but the focus areas, I, I I can't imagine they would they would change. So, you know, and these really are tied, these are the CVRD, uh, what the CVRD uh, worked with partners on in terms of um, yeah, highlighting areas to focus on going forward and, and also ties into the health network priorities. So we have a coordinating circle uh, and, and our partners, and then Lisa has been coming to our collective impact meetings as well. So the CVRD is, is highly involved in our, in our collective impact work. And, and so this is this table, um, I'm going to say it's probably at the this, the, the seeds planted little bit sprouting phase um, that we have lots of, you know, lots of work to do. We're sort of at the beginning phases of, of just laying the foundations for, uh, for this work in the community. Lot, there's tons of work that has gone on and lots of work that's going on, but what we're doing now is bringing it all under, sort of under, under one big umbrella. So moving from a hub and spoke uh, model with the health network to really bringing everyone in the same room to work on common priorities, uh, make those decisions together, um, and yeah, move forward from there. And really looking at those big systems, big systems issues, those wicked, you know, wicked problems um, that not one single agency could tackle on their own. So no small feat, but uh, feeling as I, I'm an ever optimist. So feeling optimistic that we'll, you know, we'll set a great foundation. Um, and I think this ties into the last conversation about the social planner as well. You know, see a see a great. Uh, yeah, we we're very excited that that was approved. Um, to see a great role for you know to be linked in uh, to have that connection as well as part of that collective collective impact work uh, across the community.
So now that you know I love gardening, I'll, I'll, and clearly I have children because I'm putting this slide up as well. Um, I just wanted to leave on this note, you know, puff, puff, chug, chug, went the little blue engine. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Up, 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 faster and faster and faster and faster, the little engine climbed until at last they reached the top of the mountain. And that's what I feel like right now with the Health Network. I feel like we're in this moment where, you know, we're, you know there's, there's a train where, where people are jumping on board. We're moving upstream together. We're moving, we're all, we're all kind of aligning onto the same track. And we, we will reach the top of the mountain, um, but it's going to take, you know, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of commitment and it takes a lot of, a lot of, a, a lot of perspective and it takes a lot of uh, individual and collective effort. Um, so I wasn't sure how this slide would go over to be totally honest, but I said, I thought just go for it, <laughs> just go for it. And uh, maybe my leadership team will get mad at me later. We'll find out. <laughs> or Lisa, give me a slap on hand. Um, anyhow, yeah, so I just wanted to leave leave it that note because I do feel like we are really moving in that direction and all, you know, getting on board and that we, that we can, you know, I, I think we can, we just need to keep chugging along. I actually had that book when I was a kid and I distinctly remember that exact page. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for your presentation. Um, are you open to questions? We have uh, Director Cole Hamilton online. I think he was the first to raise his hand. Great. Thanks so much, Chair, and good to see you, Danik. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I'm already on the train. I've been a big supporter of the, the Community Health Network since its inception and was really fortunate to work with Lindsay McGinn on the creation of the, uh, the substance use strategy. And anyway, it's great to work with you and with Betty and Chris and the rest of the circle. I just wanted to ask um, a question, I guess, probably for Lisa, is when reading the report, it, it, talk, it spoke about how the community health network cannot be, um, isn't supported by a service. And as a consequence, the work that you do, you, I know you put a lot of time and energy into it, um, needs to be kind of improvised or done off the side of your desk. And I, I was just wondering if you could help me understand why it was that your work with the health network couldn't fit within the uh, within the regional growth strategy function. So yeah, just curious about that, please. I see Alana come to the table, and I can take a quick stab, and then Alana, you might want to fill in after. I think I think initially the um, the the funding that the regional districts received through Island Health for the community health network um, was never targeted to a particular service, and and it. Um, and so it was a, a, an activity funded through our general government services. It was a, a flow through of funds from the Island Health through the Community Health Network uh, as the destination. And, um, and so when that funding came through, there's no staff assigned to it. There's no service in particular that it would relate to. Uh, I think that's what the, the report was trying to get at. Uh, can I have a problem? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So yeah, Alana was just shaking or, or nodding her head, nodding her head in agreement. <laughs> Could I ask a um, follow-up, please, Chair? Yes, go ahead. I'm just wondering, uh, that makes perfect sense given the circumstances. I'm just wondering if at this point in time, what it, what the process would be to bring the work that is done by the CBRD to support the health network into the RGS function, just so it can be, you know, properly fit into the workflow and work plans for people and be budgeted, I guess. I think that uh, the, the work itself would have to be described through our, our annual work plans and through through budget discussions um, and and the, the resources allocated through staff time and, and that allocation resources, that does have to go to services. So um, portions of various staff would be allocated to the regional growth strategy service, um, function 512. Um, but the work itself through the, the community health network, we'd have to um, uh, probably pull those items out and look at them through our budget process and then, and, then, uh, and then present that to the board through the budget discussions. Elena, do you want to add to, to that? Sure, thanks very much, James. Through Madam Chair to the directors. I, I think that's exactly where it's housed now and how we're thinking about it. And, and when Lisa's talking about coming back to you uh, to talk about the scope of the social plan or sort of that report out, knowing it in that first, for sure in the first several months and maybe in the first year, I think we're going to get a much clearer picture uh, to offer you as to what 
other options might be. So for now, regional growth strategy seems like a good fit uh, that was confirmed through the budget discussion around social planner and, and certainly this work working with Danica and the leadership team uh, reasonably falls into Lisa's portfolio. So I think much more to come, really good things to be thinking about and, and um, seeing how we go on that train that Danica's Thank loaded you. for us. Is that good, Director Cole Hamilton? I think so. I guess I just note that the staff report points at it not being part of the services being a bit of a challenge that's associated with the community health, health network. And it sounds to me from what I've heard from staff that integrating the work that Lisa does on the network uh, into the planning and budgeting of the RGS, that's something that's going to be happening. So if that's the case, then uh, that, that's that's great news. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Director Kerr. Thank you, and, and thanks to Danica, Lisa, Chris, and Betty for all the work that you've been doing on this, uh, with this. Um, you know, as the, the train is going up, I wonder what, what the next phases might be. And part of me thinks, you know, looking really at the outcomes and like measuring them um, in some way of what, because because there's so much catalyst work and and, you know, what do we do? We do everything, but how do you quantify it? Um, so, you know, if you look at health, like individual health and, and look at the, um, you know, cost of a hospital day, you know, a day in hospital bed is about $1,500, right? And you look at an ER visit, it's about $500 to the system. And then you look at the 80,000 that the CBRD spends, um, on, on this project and, you know, by saving 50 days in hospital or, you know, 160 ER visits, you have you easily make that up, right? And we know we know this project, this initiative is at least doing that, if not much more. Um, there was one community that uh, I know uh, aptly named the Health Link um, in another province that did this measurement pre and post intervention of how many eMERGE visits and ER visits, sorry, and hospital stays there were in the community. Um, after this uh, project went together, a similar kind of coordinating focus. And when these numbers and cost savings to the healthcare system was presented back to the regional health authority, um, it opened up more funding to keep their work going and take it to the next level. So I wonder at this growth phase of, of the community health network, whether it makes sense to like get more specific into the tangible cost savings. You know, we, we have silos in the province, but what you're doing is trying to break down those silos and, and coordinate, you know, child care and, you know, mental health and substance use and all and housing, all of these things together. So if there's a way for us to quantify that and see what, what the value is and what you're doing, that might be useful. So just a thought for future years. Thanks. Would, would you like to respond, Tanika? Yeah. First time you're here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I yeah, couldn't agree more. And I'll just, um, so going back to, I didn't go into detail uh, around the foundations of success that we're working on as a, as a kind of collective impact group. But one of the, one of the core things is that shared measurement for data and there's also understanding what the impact is. Um, and there are some really like within the poverty reduction assessment strategy, there are some, there are some, there's, there's some data, there's some sort of links to um, how each of the priorities within that and focus area will be measured, but that's the work that we need to do also is to go back. We had a lengthy conversation at our last collective impact meeting around data um, and just, you know, what that looks like in the context of the last few years during COVID, you know, poverty data looks quite different, but perhaps there's reasons for that. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate, uh, I very much appreciate that, that comment and uh, yeah, I, and it is a piece of work that we for sure will be looking, looking at, I think as we become clear through the collective work on our priorities, we will need to look at, you know, within those priorities and the pieces of work that fall under those really getting, really getting specific on the data, you know, what do we want to measure and how, and in the context of, you know, of the community, community needs and also from the lens of you know how do we sustain you know sustain the work and, and secure funding and yeah make noise where we need to make noise that's great thank you very much thank you next we have director hillian 
Thanks, Chair. Um, I do have to say, Danica, you're very brave uh, using a train as a metaphor, given the state of the uh, the railway on Vancouver Island. Um, but um, and I, I did notice that it was a clown leading the train, so I, I don't know whether that is uh, symbolic of anything or not. Uh, um, hopefully it's a happy story. But uh, um, I recall back in uh, a few years ago when I was uh, helping out with the um, formation of the coordinating circle, having arguments with the representative from Island Health about whether advocacy should in fact be a function of the health network or not. So I was really glad to see that on your list. I was a little bit uh, confused though about um, how you uh, come up with uh, the seven uh, network partners uh, in the organizational structure and how it's determined that uh, some organizations are partners. And I didn't understand whether that long list of um, in small print of organizations, whether those organizations all had some affiliation with the network or were just all the organizations in the Comox Valley. Um, Final point, I, I remember in the early stages of the uh, health network being formed that seniors organizations were quite prevalent. And so it seemed unusual to me that there wasn't perhaps a seniors organization that was a network partner to have a more formal role in, uh, in that uh, uh, organizational structure, given the health issues that um, our seniors population is certainly facing. So just a, a few points there, if you wanted to respond, thanks. Sure, thank you. And thank you for noticing about the train. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, to, so in terms of the partners, and I and I actually, I, I, in a moment, I will lean on my leadership team to talk a little bit more about the membership, the partner membership, and uh, so the history of, of why that is. Um, but I will say, so there used to be, again, we're in this process of kind of structuring differently and shifting from the more hub and spoke and sort of this distinct tables into the into this collective impact table uh in a in the most um sorry in the previous version of the network graphic there were there were action tables there's a seniors action table uh, an airshed uh, table uh those tables have um to my best knowledge dissolved uh, at least within the health network and there's lots of but i but recognizing that there's lots of lots of in the community for for senior support specifically um, and one thing that we did that did come up at a one of our collective impact meetings, uh, which includes all of all of the partners, uh, and, and an extension of that as well, and Lisa as well, was a lengthy list of who's not currently at the table, um, and and that was raised as well as on the senior you know seniors representatives uh, organizations that represent seniors support seniors in the community. So we do it is something that we are are looking you know looking at um, and. Where are we? Have, we're engaging with um, with an organization, Tamarack. I think it's in the staff report. Yeah, um, for some some guidance and coaching around the collective impact process as well. And it's you know I say process. Process is a bit misleading because it's not you know a a step step one step two. It's really an iterative, you know, it's an iterative an iterative um, process where you, yeah, it's a step by step by step, um, but not a numbered not a sequence. I should say. <laughs> And so one of the conversations we've been having is, you know, how do we bring organizations in and when do we, you know, different organizations and different voices in the community, when do we bring them in? Um, how do we bring them in, in in a meaningful, the most meaningful and impactful way? Um, so those are lots of questions that we've asked to the to the coaches of Tamarack as well. And yeah, something that we're we're ever contemplating. Um, and I think our first piece of work is looking at that. Looking at the existing assessment of the strategy, the power direction strategy, and you know, I think there's some things within that that just needs some some further review and validation and updating, and then taking that back to the broader community, you know, including organizations in the community that support seniors and represent um, seniors, and all of the other you know priority areas and focus areas noted in the strategy, perhaps other ones if that comes out in the review as well to say you know is this right you know what what are we missing. Um, is this still valid and going through an engagement process with the broader community uh, around that? And then from that, seeing, okay, what are their priorities? What are the community priorities now? And then who needs to be at the, the ongoing uh, collective impact table? Because that membership will shift, uh, will shift and change too as different uh, things become, you know, priority. And then, yeah. So I'm going to, uh, maybe I'll do that here. Chris, do you have any commentary around the, the existing partners and sort of how they 
came to me, me versus other ones. I'll just start by saying you, you have to come up and use a mic. Um, can you come to the podium? Thank you. There, okay. Um, so when we started with the development of the network, um, before it was, we had two community um, forums and um, some of us that were um, talking about, does the community want a community health network? We went around to um, a lot of the organizations in the community and actually Director Hillian, I think it was you at the social planning one that said, oh, so is the community health network gonna replace the social planning uh, society? And it was like, no that what we want to do is, is bring in the organizations and the collaboratives and all the work that was being done in the community in separate um, coalitions, collaboratives, et cetera, broad-based um, organizations, not sort of one um, focus organizations. And so that was a really fundamental way we started it. Um, the network. And then when we had the community forums, the community defined the priorities. So those partners were collaborations in the community that were working on the initial priorities. So for instance, the um, Child and Youth Collaborative or the Early Years Collaborative that was here at your last meeting, they were doing all the, all, a lot of work with children, youth, and families. So, and they're out for over 40 organizations in the community. And pretty much every one of those, it says Immigrant Welcome Center there. That's really their welcoming um, communities coalition, which is another coalition. And I'm going to let Chris speak to Pride and Seniors because those are the two yeah, that, that really aren't large collaboratives. Yeah, thanks very much. I think that's that's probably enough uh, just in, in terms of the, the question. Um, and you're right, it was me who uh, had some thoughts about different people or the same people at different tables wearing different hats. <laughs> um, I did want to um, make one further comment, Chair, if that's okay. The, um, during the, uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, Director Arbor and Director Grieve and myself uh, convened a, a, an online conversation about men's health um given our concern that uh, many of the issues that we see in our community including the uh, toxic drug crisis and such um disproportionately impact men and um so I, i'd be remiss if i didn't uh, say that uh, we certainly uh, felt that uh, there was some room for initiatives related to men's health that hopefully the community health network or island health would consider taking on and um so i just throw that into the, the pot today if uh, you're looking uh, for any projects to work on. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next, we have Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. Uh, perfect segue in. I think you called me a clown a moment ago without realizing it as a new conductor. Uh, so in regards to um, um, the work that's being done, I just want to acknowledge like such important and difficult work. And um, that, uh, you know, a few of us went, were in Toronto at FCM and what's on the mind of people across Canada and municipalities, how to, to address so many of the social issues that we currently have. And it can be disheartening. Um, 2019 is when the province, I guess, um, put out their poverty reduction uh, strategy, so to speak, of which many grants have flowed from. And the target was to reduce child um, poverty by 25% by tw next year and by 50% for children by next year. I don't know if, if you'll be able to comment on whether we're going to reach these targets. In my mind, things have worsened. And what I notice, not just here, but elsewhere in the post pandemic world, is it feels like there's a group that is continues to do well um, across Canada and con continues to get richer. And, and I think the bottom is falling out 
on a lot of the middle class and the lower class. And that only adds pressure to the work that all the organizations in town are trying to do. Um, so that'd be one question is whether we're going to achieve, achieve the poverty targets of the province. And then the second is, um, is there a network of network of networks? So because a lot of the stuff we're talking about requires provincial and federal support, like is there an annual symposium where different community health networks around the province come together to talk about advocacy? Like, are, or, or are you operating in, because you've talked a lot about the good work of all your members, but is there an, uh, another layer of uh, that could inform our advocacy at the regional district as well? Um, and sorry, I'm not part of the network, so I, Maybe the answer is evident to others in the room, but I don't know. So if I thought I'd ask. So it's a really interesting question. <laughs> two, two interesting questions. <laughs> so that was a. Thank you. Um, that was a big discussion that we had at our last collective impact um, meeting because we went to look at the data and see where we were with the new census data, et cetera. And in fact, we've met the target. Both the province and the valley have met the product, the, the, which was very upsetting to us because we know um, on the ground that we haven't met the target. And the reason is because the, um, and this is actually, it's actually in the BC poverty reduction report also. Um, and the reason is because of the COVID um, supports that people got and the census was 2021. And so um, it looked like there is. So the discussion we've been having is perhaps those sort of hard percentages without the context aren't the way to measure poverty. And that's the um, conversation that we're having um, now at our next meeting, actually, I think when we want to determine a common agenda and what the target is for moving forward. And we're actually looking more at things like um, moving people. We haven't got it yet. I can't remember what it was at the last that we came up with, but, um, but having some sort of a qualitative and quantitative. And so, you know, you have to be careful about data. I don't tell anybody that we've reached the target. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to address your other question, your your is there a network of network of networks? Um, yes. And in fact, just last week was the convening of the of that network of network of networks. Um, in Nanaimo. Where were we? Yeah, so we were in Nanaimo. And so that was every so there's eight health networks across the island. Um, and they are unique to the island. It is, it is an island health initiative. Um, so there are eight health networks across the island and every health network uh, was, had the opportunity to invite the various representatives from their community, um, from the health network and the Henderson Regional District. Um, and Island Health also, also joined. So they have several representatives like the medical health officers or several NHOs who were there as well as some, some staff, uh, you know, public health staff. And so, it is it is a a convening of the health networks, uh, but I would say it's I don't think there was provincial representation in terms of like government other than you know health authority if you want to put under that umbrella. Um, but we and, and that's been an annual that's an annual gathering. But one of the one of the conversations that that we had uh, that some of us had um, as part of the facilitation of that day was around the idea of developing. Um, a community of practice or something along those lines where it is an opportunity for you know the health network facilitators and coordinators and you know government staff and elected officials or whoever has a vested interest in in this work and i hope it's everybody um can convene and, and have those call conversations and you know not just cross-pollinate within our own community but cross-pollinate across communities and maybe you know maybe even in broader 
Um, I think the other thing, other thing to note is the so through the Tamarack Institute, which is where we doing our, our coaching, our, our collective impact coaching, they do have a, uh, a community of practice uh, for BC and, and a, um, a national community of practice as well. And the CVRD through, uh, through Elena and Lisa did purchase a, a membership to, um, to, to a, the Communities Ending Poverty, I don't know what collaborative, I don't know what we actually mean. Just community, I guess it's just community of practice, yeah. And so that opens opens up um, opportunity for uh, for anyone in the community to partake in, you know, to to tune into a variety of of conversations and those. those lot, it, so it is an opportunity to cross pollinate and learn from other communities that have seen successes and challenges in in all of these complex issues. So, yeah. Thanks. Next, we have Director Morin. Great, thank you, Chair. Thanks so much for the update. Um, I, I was curious about um, the involvement of folks with lived experience. I know within um, under the seven uh, kind of umbrella um, organizations, there's all the agencies and, and many of them involve folks with lived experience and you're getting uh, feedback that way. But I guess I'm curious about um, whether there's an opportunity to have a more formalized role, like I'm thinking of um, Vandu in Vancouver, Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, which of course has been um, in existence for a long time and has really affected some uh, major uh, policy over the years. It's very well recognized, has been very well researched, but we also have Nandu and Nanaimo that's just in terms of folks who use substances, but then we've also, I've heard, have mom stop the harm coming to town more formally, and they're going to be doing some supports for caregivers of folks with um, uh, challenges with substances. And then, of course, there's all the, the folks living in poverty as well. And I guess I'm just wondering if there are some opportunities for formalizing some of that to really create... Um, a stronger voice for people who um, whose voices don't get heard, and um, if there's an opportunity to to mobilize some of the, those folks, which of course would also help perhaps with uh, stigma busting and um, and education for the community, uh, because it's my view that that's the only way um, we really can. <laughs> can uh, break that barrier is for, for people to, to learn more about people with lived experience. Um, so it was a very long winded question, but I, I just know that there are many, um, many organized groups of people with lived experience who are doing some amazing, vital, important work. And I'm just wondering if there might be an opportunity here to under the, the health network to, to formalize that, to take all the folks that we're already hearing from and mobilize that into a more formalized way. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I'll start and then I'll, I'll pass the mic once again to people that have been at the network much longer than I. Um, so I, I would I would say I see there being a huge opportunity uh, to do that, and I, I think that would be informed by the collective impact um, process. And so the organizations that that are already partnered, we're partnered with, I think would be you know, the first. You know, there are uh, on many of those tables there are individuals with lived living experience um, that are part of those tables already, and so you know instead of trying to sort of you know create a separate table i don't we you know we don't want to rob peter from paul or whatever that expression is <laughs> um yeah so just i think working through that kind of impact process and saying what does this look like and and you know is this something you know that there that there's value and you know i you know i i see there being huge value um but again to just being respectful of that collective impact process i think yeah engaging our partners um and who our partners recommend other in the community to inform the the how, I guess the what and the how and the when and the who. Is yeah. my initial thought. Thank you for that. Um, go ahead if you have more to add. Well, buddy's walking over there. Um, I'll say to you when we do, um, it's a, diff a little different than, than what you're talking about, like having a specific table um, as a sort of an advisory table is what I'm I'm understanding that to be. Um, 
when we recruit to the coordinating circle, it is something that we, you know, we don't ask people to disclose, but it's, you know, it's members of the community and we think every, I, I, I everything is valuable, right? And lived experience is, is exceptionally valuable, if not the most valuable thing that someone can bring. Um, and so we do try and reinforce that in the kind of the messaging and you know, as we're recruiting for the, the coordinating circle uh, with the health network so that we get that, that lens um, and that perspective. Just want to quickly mention that yesterday I was on a webinar actually, and it was about this very thing, and it was actually Kelowna. Um, and when I get the recording, I'll send it to all of you. Um, but they started with a circle, a community circle of people with lived experience, is what they called it, which I think is a really nice name, which has moved into actually a nonprofit, a social enterprise nonprofit. And what that group, which is supported by Kelowna and um, Urban Matters is involved in these. And, and there were municipalities from all across the, the Western, from Manitoba uh, West. And they're now, um, what's happening is that organization, which is a social enterprise of people with lived experience, are hiring people to be peer navigators um, in certain areas. So the libraries is in Kelowna, that was an easy win, but talking about like peer navigators in emergency so that when peers go to services, they are, the first point of access is a peer mm -hmm. and to help them with that. So it is happening in other places. And I was on there, uh, texting with Carrie from the substance use strategy said we've got to do this here so um when I see it I'll send it that's great just very quickly yeah that sounds amazing and um I I yeah I just I just see that that's an important component to and actually maybe providing you know training and support for people to take those leadership roles because I think right now we we have amazing folks out in the community with lived experience doing all kinds of things, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, have that kind of body of support that could really help um, make that impact. So thank you for that. Thank you. And I'll just check online with Director Cole Hamilton, because see if his hand was up from before or if he has another question. Oh, it's up from before, I'll take it down. Okay. okay, thank you. So I noticed in your introduction slide that you did um, use the word backbone, and I know that um, that, that was a, an outcome of the poverty reduction strategy was to identify a backbone organization. And um, in your use of that word, I was wondering if you guys were accepting that, <laughs> that role. Um, and this, it, it sounds like it is, as the discussion uh, went today, but, or if, that was something that um, that didn't didn't seem to fit um, with the organization. So I think that's a, a it's a good question. Um, I think that the uh, health network is certainly well positioned to be that backbone recognizing that um, we're at the beginning stages of the collective impact process, and that can change through what's determined as the, sort of the needs and, and the common agenda and the projects. Um, I think that a backbone organization um, like the Health Network is well positioned in its connections and its um, uh, with the partners, I think we also have to, once we see sort of what the direction of the um, collective impact takes, we also have to ensure that there's also the capacity within the health network to do that. Um, and I think as a, you know, the partners will have to consider that, but also CVRD will have to consider that as well. Um, and uh, the train. We'll have to, we've got to have a got, got to got to have a track for the train, and I see that track being the the backbone. So we have to make sure that that is well maintained and, and can support the work that's going on. Do you want to add anything? Only 
Yeah. Hey, that, that's great to hear. And I think that you can tell by the, the conversation today that um, the interest is here at, at the board and, and the belief that um, that the health network does have capacity to address a lot of the uh, wicked problems that, that we're facing. Um, obviously in collaboration with, <laughs> with local government. So thanks so much. All right, so we were on receipt um, and I don't see any more lights. So I'll call the question, all in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thanks, Danica, Betty, and Chris. Okay, so we're on item five, the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Regional Application. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor, and I'll pass it over to Steph. Thank you, Chair, and I'm pleased to introduce Carrie McIntyre. Carrie is our Emergency Planning Coordinator, and we'll be introducing uh, both reports five and six here. So, Carrie, over to you. Thank you. I'm told I'm always quiet, so can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. That's good. Um, so, yes, thanks uh, for having us here today um, on behalf of the emergency program. So, we've got two reports for you. Um, we're here to tell you that we've found some money. We're not asking for money. So um, the first is the uh, UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Uh, this is a regional application for the Public Notification and Evacuation Route Planning Grant. And so a big thank you to um, the staff uh, from the municipalities who worked with me to um, make this grant possible. Uh, same with Comox First Nation as well, who are big supporters of this grant going forward. And what this grant is for is basically to help us uh, do a more, uh, take a more collaborative approach to that public notification and evacuation route planning. Um, so this grant is very much a planning grant. It's not an operational or equipment focused grant. Uh, and it's there to support us to do the advanced planning that we'll need to do in the event of having to evacuate various parts um, of the community um, within the CBRD uh, with the Comox Valley boundaries. And I'm sure you've been paying attention to the news. It's very timely right now, given what's happening uh, just south of us at Cameron Lake. Uh, that is, um, there's some road closures down there and it's involving a couple of different regional districts and nations uh, and a lot of different agencies uh, having to work together to sort of coordinate that ev evacuation route planning and to align their messaging. So that is exactly what this grant is about, um, to do that advanced planning piece. And I'll just add that a bulk of the funding um, from this grant application, if we're successful, will go towards um, LIDAR. So we're looking for more data and metadata uh, to fill in some of the gaps of data that we are have from some of the other studies that have been done, um, but we've noticed that there's some gaps in the LIDAR that's available from us uh, to us from GOBC, and then also some of the data that's come from the uh, coastal vulnerability studies that Comox First Nation has completed, as well as the coastal mapping project. Um, so uh, all in all, we'll be able to use that data as well as um, provide more data um, if we are successful. Great, thank you, Carrie. Are there any questions for Carrie? I just wanted to add that uh, yesterday I attended uh, the pre-budget uh, consultation for the province um, in Campbell River, and um, and we did bring uh, emergency management as an item. Um, uh, we we were allowed to uh, talk about three different budget requests, and and that was one of our requests, and uh, it. We spoke to how um, applying for each of these grants separately and, and chasing grant funding for uh, an emergency service is problematic and, and stable funding would help us um, collaborate as a region a lot easier um, than um, these individual grants. Um, although we are very happy that <laughs> these grants are available to us. So just wanted to let you know. Thank you for that, yeah. Okay, so we're on receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And recommendation moved by Greaves, seconded by Moran. And that's that the board approved the application submitted to UBC 
uh, Community Emergency Preparedness Fund 2023. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of the areas because we haven't actually combined our emergency management <laughs> yet. So vote of the areas, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. And on to item six, which is UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund uh, for the Emergency Operations Center and Training. Um, sorry, who moved? Director Grieve and Director McCollum, thank you. And back to Carrie. Okay, great, thank you so much. And as mentioned, this is about the Emergency Operations Center and Training Grant, again, a regional grant. Um, this one has already been awarded in principle, um, so we have been successful, which is great news. So it's uh, for the amount of 150000 total with 30000 from each of the members who've um, participated on this grant application. And the grant is, again, about um, that reciprocity in action. This is to support us to uh, continue our work with the regional EOC or the Emergency Operations Center to ensure that we're able to support any activations and support one another um, through that mutual aid. And, and partnership approach. And um, much of the funds uh, will be supporting some of the recommendations that came out of Fracture on Fifth, um, the exercise to continue that training, those recommendations um, specifically, as well as some, some new opportunities that have been identified through um, our uh, collective par participation in the Totem Plan of Platinum uh, Air Disaster Exercise, which just occurred. And this grant also allows Comox First Nation um, to uh, get a much needed um, uh, generator for one of their facilities to ensure that they can continue operations if they're impacted by an, a power outage. And it also allows uh, the Village of Cumberland to complete their EOC. So very multifaceted, but benefits all of us collectively. Great, thanks again. And do you have a question, Director Arbor? Yeah, thanks. I, I just want to pick up on the conversation from earlier around, um, you know, the, the the grant situation. So just for staff, like, as far as I understand, most of our services um, just funded through property taxes, I guess that's, that provides the backbone. <laughs> we were using backbone earlier for the emergency service. And so if I'm clear, there's no direct transfer from the province to services like that. So my question is, does every regional district in the province has an emergency service or are there some that don't have one? Because I haven't heard a lot of advocacy. I mean, I, I'm glad we're doing advocacy and I wonder about the uh, uh, the committee that our chair presented to, but um, I'm not aware of like strong resolutions at UBCM or otherwise to have better core funding uh, as partners because the province is having to respond to all these things like there were the flooding in the lower mainland a year and a half ago we have the forest fires like th this is ongoing and um and i just wonder if if they would consider actually core funding and participating in those services so my only question for today is really does every regional district have a uh, emergency uh, response and preparedness service Thank you for your question through the chair. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, under the Emergency Program Act legislation, all local governments are required to have uh, an emergency program representative of some sort. And what you might find is a, a, a variety uh, of what that looks like, where municipalities might pair with a regional district uh, or independently have all of their own. In our case, um, we certainly liaise with the emergency program delegates from each of the municipalities. Uh, and then um, I'm considered to be the EPC, which is meeting the requirements of the act. Now you know that that act is about to change and we're all waiting um, for the new release of that act as well. So that may shift what that looks like going forward. And um, our understanding is that they are asking uh, communities to work as uh, collaboratively and as regionally as possible going forward because we're all constantly in a state of response now. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. So um, yeah, and if staff has ideas for us to, um, I know we're already doing advocacy, obviously it made the top three priorities, but what I'm thinking is if, if they're building, if the provincial strategy is to build capacity through grants, 
the people who have invested in some capacity are going to have the capacity to apply for the grants, right? And the regional districts or municipalities that haven't uh, are probably not very prepared. And guess where the worst uh, emergency events are going to happen in those places that are not prepared, that didn't chase grant, and et cetera. So it seems like a funny approach, as the chair said, to something that is so core and important to all communities that I, I think we should really see if they can move from a grant model to a core contribution model over time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and um, I did talk about that yesterday, how um, each of the local governments, each municipality and the regional district and the, the First Nation can declare their own state of emergency. And that happened uh, during COVID, um, not here. We did a regional uh, emergency operations center, but in other areas, each local government doing their own um, um, state of emergency can, can be a lot more difficult for the province to deal with um, each of those governments one-on-one um, -on -one, as opposed to everybody collaborating and exchanging information and resources um, on a regional level. And um, and I'm sure that the province is wanting to encourage that and ho hopefully they will do that um, uh, through their budget process as well. Okay, I don't see any further lights. And we're on receipt. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. And there's a recommendation for this one. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Morin. And that's that the Comox Valley approved the application uh, for the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Emergency Operations Center and training for up to fifty, $150,000. Any further discussion? Okay, again, in both the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. And thanks, Carrie and Howie. And Ron, oh, we actually already did item seven, so we get to jump right on to bylaws and resolutions uh, to amend at second reading. First, we have bylaw 589, the Rural Comox Valley Official Community Plan Amendment number four. So Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Now we're on to bylaws for adoption. And we have bylaw number 732, Graham Lake Water Service Establishment bylaw. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. It's a vote of the full board for adoption. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to bylaw 740, the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw Amendment number 11. Moved by Grant, seconded by Morin. It's for adoption and it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. On to bylaw number 741, Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw Amendment number 12. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. Again, a vote of the areas for adoption. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And we're on to bylaw 749, the committee delegation bylaw. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant for adoption. It's a vote of the full board and it requires a two thirds vote. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. On to bylaw 765, the Comox Valley Water Conservation Bylaw, Amendment number nine. Moved by Grant, second by Hillian. And this is a vote of the areas and Courtney Comox. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Number seven, bylaw number 766 or 767, Electoral Area Parks Regulation, Amendment nine. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve for adoption. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. And we do have an addendum that we need approved. Uh, Hillian moved that the addendum be considered, seconded by Arbor. And all in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And 
Uh, we have strengthening communities grant uh, moved by Killian, seconded by Grant, and I'll pass it to staff. Thank you, Chair. This um, correspondence, thank you for considering it uh, as a late item on the agenda. It just came into the CBRD uh, earlier earlier today. Um, the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Courtney has identified uh, a request to have the CBRD um, support this grant extension for the Strengthening Communities grant. Uh, the, the correspondence from Courtney does um, report out on the activities over the past uh, year, I believe it is, and um, and there's an opportunity here for some additional funding um, to continue this project for another year. So, um, City of Courtney has requested this this uh, letter of support from the CVRD, and uh, and it would be for the board to consider support. Thank you. Any questions? Director Arbor, go ahead. Well, it sounds like we've reached out of poverty targets uh, from Betty. So, uh, you know, it doesn't look like we need an extension. I'm just kidding. It was good that she qualified that. And it was such a surprise answer as well. But it made sense with all the COVID, the government's providing basically basic income to everybody. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, no, no reason. To, I just wanted to comment on that but in favor. Thank you. So we're on receipt and it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, moved by Helene, seconded by Arbor. The requested action that CBRD as partnering municipality and the Strengthening Communities Grant is in support of the grant extension and additional funding requests made by the City of Courtney. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's a second item on the addendum. It's electoral area service committee um, minutes from June 5th. Or right, okay. So the minutes are going to come to the following meeting, but we do have a recommendation that needed to be heard at this meeting. Um, does staff want to speak to that at all? Um, this was a matter that was considered yesterday at the Electoral Area Services Committee uh, meeting, and, and it is a floodplain exemption permit. Um, I understand that there's interest in having this approved earlier than the, the, the end of June board meeting. Um, committee did, that, did not have any objections to the, to the resolution that was put forward. Okay. And that's for Singing Sands Road. That's right. In Area B. Director Arbor? Yeah, thank you. And for the rest of the board, we are trying to accelerate our processes. So this is one tiny example of that. But uh, there was actually a really good discussion for those interested around floodplain and, and the rest of that and how difficult it is now to uh, build a seashore and how long it takes. Um, we had one applicant who has spent, uh, I think, three years or something in, 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 the, in, the, in the grinder. Um, and it's all for good policy reasons, but uh, it's 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 hard. I'd also like to mention that you know we're continuing to look for ways to uh, reduce our timelines, but um, it's also good to see that none of the municipalities or the regional district made the forty-seven naughty lists of the province. I I don't know what the province is doing around uh, the new approach, and uh, I've seen the mayor's response across this week, and uh, it seems very. Um, not very collegial between the local government and the province on, on the housing issue. So I'm just I'm just glad that nobody in the Comox Valley is targeted by the province right now for uh, <laughs> building more housing. Thanks. I mean, we want to build more housing, but being targeted as being the culprit of no more housing. OK. It's a vote of the areas. Oh, do we have a move and seconder for the recommendation? Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grant. Again, a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. And we can move in camera. 